Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 29th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss how the Fairbanks News Miner badly botched an analysis of Alaska's tax burden. Second, we ask whether Senate finance even cares about Alaska families and the overall Alaska economy. Third, some recent discussions about potential vetoes makes us wonder whether the governor is part of the fiscal solution or has he become part of the problem. And now, let's join Michael. We're going to dive into the weekly top three here today, and I know that you want to take uh, you want to take aim first and foremost at the um, uh, Fairbanks Daily News Miner for a piece that they were talking about on the uh, the analytics of taxes uh, because taxes are now becoming. I know you and I have talked about them for years, um, but uh, taxes are now being taken up by some of the legislators and, of course, some of the uh, the mouthpieces for. Uh, for that movement, including the uh, newspaper editorial boards. So uh, what say you about the Fairbanks Daily News Miner and this brand new uh, this brand new piece they got out? So the News Miner ran an article that says Alaska's lowest Alaska lowest tax state in comparison of state local rates. And it goes on with a fairly lengthy article for the News Miner uh, to analyze a uh, a survey or a, or a report that had been done by a website called a wallet hub. So I, my reaction to that first was um, to to read through the article and and realize that they weren't including PFD cuts uh, as part of the as part of the government take as part of the diversion of private sector revenues to government, which is the classic definition of taxes. And uh, and so I did what, frankly, I enjoy doing a lot. I opened up a spreadsheet. And uh, and started to do some calculations, and and they were rather eye-opening even to me. So the Wallet Hub analysis said Alaska's effective tax rate uh, that that Wallet Hub used was 5.84 percent, or 3,700 dollars, uh, compared to 5.8 percent of median household income uh, for the U.S. The median household income for the U.S. And the reason they did that, the reason Wallet Hub did that is they wanted to compare the states. So they, they wanted to use a common base uh, to compare the states, and, uh, and that's they used median household income. Uh, and that 5.84% uh, was, in fact, or that number is, in fact, uh, the lowest of all the states. When you go to the Wallet Hub website, you, you see the list of the states, you see all the tax rates, right. uh, and Alaska is the lowest. But here's, here's the thing that, that really uh, I... Even I was surprised by it. when you start when you add in PFD cuts uh, from the from the statutory PFD the amount of the statutory PFD that's been diverted to government uh, as a as essentially as a tax uh, revenue to government the numbers change a lot um, Alaska's tax rate goes from 5.84 percent to 14.32 percent the amount taken. Per household, which is how they, uh, which is how Wallet Hub did this, the amount taken per household goes from thirty-seven hundred dollars to nine thousand dollars per family. Alaska's rank goes from lowest in the nation to third highest uh, in the nation as a percent of income, uh, <laughs> outpaced only by uh, Illinois and Connecticut. 
we fall behind, we fall between New York and Connecticut uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a tax rate. Even if you look at the PFD alone, just, just the amount of the PFD cut alone, that's an 8.5% tax rate using Wallet, wallet Hub's uh, analysis. Uh, and it ranks Alaska uh, not first lowest, ninth lowest in the nation, uh, right behind Colorado uh, in front of Tennessee, and, and very near California, uh, just the PFD cut portion alone. So what's, what's really going on here, and I, you know, this, this obviously irritated me, um, and, and my response to the, to the news miner was, look, you've got this wrong. I mean, PFD cuts are Alaska's version of an income tax. Right. They're a targeted, targeted tax on income, and, and you need to include those numbers. And, and the response was, well, Wallet Hub didn't do that, so, you know, we don't need to do that. But, but that's, that's just, I mean, that's, um, that's just obfuscating, or that's just that's just you know excusing yourself. PFD PFD cuts are a tax on Alaska families. They do reduce the level of income of Alaska families. They do divert that income from Alaska families to uh, to uh, to government. So if you're going to look at government take, if you're going to look at the at the impact, the dollars, uh, and what that does as a percent of income uh, to government take. You have to PFD in Alaska. PFD cuts are part of that. Newsminer should have known that. Newsminer exists in Alaska. You can exi- you can you can excuse Wallet Hub because they're a national organization. You can't expect them to know the intricacies of all 50 states, but the Newsminer certainly knows uh, the the impact of of PFD cuts and uh, and and at least should have included some reference to it in the course of the discuss uh, discussing it. But the thing the, the thing that really drove drove this home to me is when you include the impact of PFD cuts on Alaska families, Alaska goes from the least taxed state in the nation to the 49th most taxed state in the nation, uh, in, the, in, the, in the top three, if you will, of the, uh, of the most taxed states uh, in the nation. And I, and, and I, think, that's, I think that's eye-opening. I mean, it's, it, is, it is, you know, when Alaskans go around and say, oh, we aren't taxed and, you know, and, and, and we, we, we get along just fine and we don't have to send much money to government. We're sending a huge boatload amount of government, amount of money to government uh, uh, each year out of, out of the households in, a, in, 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 in rank order equal to what Illinois, New York, Connecticut, Pennsylvania are taking uh, are taking for uh, for their state governments, and I and I and I think I think Alaskans should should be aware of that fact, and we should be talking about that fact. It's right. Not we we aren't not taxed. We are taxed heavily. Right. And it's a little you know it's again it's kind of this disingenuousness of those uh, in the you know in the editorial boards of the various newspapers around the state to kind of like obfuscate that. Uh, and say, well, you know, it's really, you know, if you look at it, but again, an apples to apples comparison shows what the truth is. They just don't want to, they they just do not want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, speak the truth, quite honestly, because it doesn't it doesn't fill their need or their agenda of basically saying we need to take all of the PFD. And eventually we need to have, and again, it's an excuse. Well, we're the lowest tax state, so we could put taxes on and it'd be okay because we'd still be one of the lowest tax state. This is, of course, after we take all of your PFD. Uh, and so that is the message that you're seeing in all, you know, in almost all these editorials that I'm reading. They're almost all kind of implicating that, like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We're not taxed at all, so we could afford a little bit of a tax here. Yeah. It's uh, it it, it uh, it's eye opening. It's not just the it's not just the editorial board. It's 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 a, a a fairly hefty number of legislators who go around saying the same thing. But it's just it's stunning to me. Forty we rank forty ninth when you include the PFD cuts, the effective PFD cuts. We rank forty ninth in the nation, behind only Illinois and Connecticut. Uh, we take more than New York. We take more than Pennsylvania. We take more than California. Way more than California. Uh, on a on a household household basis, and uh, and and for those who say that you know Alaska's not taxed or as you say not taxed uh, that that we have we have capacity to take more we don't and and the other the other thing that that you know comes home about this is that tax burden is largely on middle and lower income Alaska families it's not spread evenly across all Alaska families it's not like New York's. 
that is a progressive income tax that hits you know wealthier families uh, hardest. Uh, Alaska's is a is the PFD cuts a hugely regressive tax. In fact, all of Alaska's taxes right now are hugely regressive taxes that hit middle and lower income Alaska families hardest. So, you know, if you were looking, if you were if you were rank ordering by most regressive. Uh, uh, biggest impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. Clearly, Alaska would rank first uh, using uh, using using that standard. So it's, I mean, that's for for legislators who may happen to be listening, for uh, uh, listeners uh, who are talking to others. That's the number we ought to be using. We ought to be using what the impact on Alaska families is, what the impact on Alaska households is, of all of the diversion of private sector income to government. Uh, and, uh, and, and once you do that, uh, the number is just staggering. I'm 14% on average of, of median household income, uh, national income, uh, $9,000 per household, ranks as 49th uh, in the nation. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We just need to be spreading this information far and wide, right? I mean, Brad, this is what it all comes down to. I mean, we've got to point out the fact that there I mean, there are holes in this logic. This is, you know, as I said, this is not the first editorial, nor is it the first time a legislator has taken these things on and said these things. We just need to say, well, not really. Here's what the truth is. When you factor in the PFD uh, taking, we are now the highest, and we can't afford any more tax. I mean, these are things that we should be saying. Well, can't afford any more taxes, and 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 can't afford certainly can't afford any ta- any more taxes that hit middle and lower income Alaska families. If 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 what we're if what we're doing, if we do need these revenues, if the legislature determines we do need these revenues, we at least need to get them off the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families and spread them evenly uh, across all Alaska families. Um, but it's just uh, the, the fact when you add in the PFD, the fact we rank 49th in the nation uh, uh, behind only Connecticut and Illinois uh, in terms of tax burden, in terms of government take, state government take uh, from uh, state and local government take from, uh, from private sector income uh, is just, uh, it's just staggering to me. I mean, I expected we'd end up somewhere in the middle, that we that we that we wouldn't be first lowest, that we'd end up somewhere in the middle. But, but turns out we uh, we we end up third third from the top. <laughs> and again, this is utilizing Wallet Hub's uh, formulaic uh, driven uh, numbers and and accounting for those metrics. And so it's an apples to apples comparison at that point. Uh, I mean, I, I'm hoping. Have you posted about this up on your Facebook page? I have. I posted a short uh, a short blip uh, uh, last week. Uh, I'm going to do it again, um, and, uh, and and this may actually be the subject matter of a of a op-ed that I that I do because I'm I, this is I mean even to me even to me this is a staggering number it's a staggering it it, it it's a staggering comparison that we go from the lowest in the nation when you factor in the PFD cuts it goes to the to the third highest in the nation. That's just, that's, that, it's I, astonishing. I, I yeah. I'm, I'm repeating myself, but I can't say it enough. It's just yeah. staggering. Yeah, absolutely astonishing. Uh, all right, uh, let's move on to number two, uh, which is the Senate Finance Committee. They're starting to talk now about uh, bringing the PFD formula forward. There was a piece in uh, Alaska's news source over at KTUU uh, where they talked and touted the spending cap proposals by Spahn Holtz and Von Imhoff and the governor and everything else. And then they moved on to the discussion about the PFD and the fiscal aspects of the PFD. And, of course, uh, the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, Bert Stedman, was quoted in there saying, oh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk about the PFD. We're going to have an explanation on the mathematics of it. Then we're going to go into the partisan and ideological discussions of the dividend. Uh, what, what do they miss on this? Give me, give me your take. Well, the, the statement that Seven made is there will be an explanation of the impact of the PFD on the state's fiscal situation. Then, you know, we'll move on. We'll move on to other things. There, that misses the point. I mean, to, to pick up on the theme from the first point, uh, the impact of the PFD on the state's fiscal situation is is just the starting point. The, the, where you need to take that then is what's the impact of 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 the PFD and PFD cuts in particular on Alaska families and the Alaska economy. Government's function should not should not stop at simply how are we going to pay for government? What what kind of government do we want and how are we going to pay for it? It should it should continue on to and what's the impact of the various alternatives of paying for it 
on Alaska families in the Alaska economy. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, you know, if you, if you had a, a list and you said this is the has the largest adverse effect on Alaska in, in the abstract. You had a list that said this is the largest adverse in, impact on Alaska families in the Alaska economy, and this is the lowest impact. You can produce the same amount of money. One has a huge impact. One has a lower impact. Which do you want to do? In the abstract, you'd say I want the lowest. But but what we've been doing is using the tool that has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families and the overall Alaska economy, um, and without without analyzing at all whether there are other tools that can be used uh, if you assume this is the amount of money they need, other tools that can be used that have a lower impact. So just an, an analysis of what the impact is of PFDs on the state's fiscal situation is just, is just the starting point. It's not the ending point. But there's no recognition that I've seen in Senate Finance over the last five years and not and not now about about what that full analysis should be. They've never had Ledger fin Finance talk about the impact on Alaska families and the Alaska economy. They've never analyzed that. Frankly, they don't want to because they would they would they would have to surface the fact that it has the largest adverse impact. And that's the point. I mean, they know. Here's the thing: they're they're avoiding it like the plague. Uh, they go right to what does it cost the state and how does it affect the state finances, and that's the bottom line. Uh, that's that's all that, that seems to. And again, this goes back to my commentary earlier, where it's always sacrificing the public economy, the public sector economy, at the at the uh, at the uh, expense of the private sector economy. You know, everything else doesn't matter as long as the public sector economy survives and gets good. That's what we need to concern ourselves with, and I think it is a disingenuous. Uh, look at what's going on. You ca- you cannot. It does not happen in a vacuum. One impacts the other, and if you don't at least take a look at that and acknowledge that, then you're again you're being disingenuous. And I think that's what a lot of these politicians are failing to factor in on, and they don't they don't want to make that point because, as you said, it, once it surfaces and comes to the light of day, then they'd have to live with that. Uh, I mean, they may know it in their hearts, they may know it quietly amongst themselves, but they don't want that out amongst the public. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. And that and this relates to the first point. I mean, the first point is the news miner just took the wallet hub analysis at face value and stopped there. They didn't go further and look at the impact of what PFD cuts are doing uh, on on the on the government take uh, out of the private sector. The Senate, in the same way, just wants to stop at looking at what the PFD does to the state's fiscal situation. They don't want to look. At, at what the impact of that is on Alaska families and the overall Alaska economy. Everybody's, everybody's trying to stop their analysis at a certain point that, uh, you know, if the analysis goes from 1 to 10, they're trying to stop it at 5 uh, and say, look, 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 I win. Look, you know, we, right. have, a low tax, we have a low tax burden. Or look, uh, uh, PFDs have this huge impact on the state's fiscal situation. We can't, we can't afford them. Uh, anymore, they want to stop their analysis at five, as opposed to going through, you know, the the six six through ten, which are the important parts of what what is the impact on Alaska families and the Alaska economy uh, of going down this road. Well, right. when you when you look at it from the Wallet Hub using the Wallet Hub standards, it moves Alaska to the third largest tax burden in the nation. When you look at it from the standpoint of what Senate Finance should be looking at, impact on Alaska families and Alaska, the overall Alaska economy, it has the largest adverse impact on those two. Everybody's trying to stop their analysis before they get to the part that matters most. Well, and I have to laugh because early in the article when they're talking about spending caps, Natasha is quoted as saying, oh, you know, we, our, my own bill has been modeled and stress tested and includes a permanent fund dividend because to me a dollar is a dollar, but only if it's a dollar to government. If it's a dollar going out to other people, then she's not interested in that discussion. Uh, I, again, a dollar is a dollar, but only when it's convenient for the for the mathematics or for the for the presentation that you want to put forward. Well, uh, and from her perspective, it's not a dollar out of her pocket, so it doesn't it, it doesn't matter because right, she, exactly. she doesn't have to pay it. Others have to pay. It. And I got to tell you, Brad, this article is so full of stuff. Uh, I mean, the whole first part of the article talks about the uh, talks about the spending caps, and nobody even bats an eye. I mean, they say it right here: the proposal would set the cap based on an average state spending over the last three years, with allowances for inflation and population growth. You mean the last three years where we have spent, you know, between thirty and fifty percent more than we've taken in? That seems like a good spend. I mean, nobody is pointing out the fact that a spending cap based on expenditures means nothing. 
And, and then they go on to talk about how, well, a, a constitutional spending cap would be hard. But then again, they ignore the fact that any, you know, that, that these politicians who are in the legislature have willy nilly ex- just ignored statutory law at, to their heart's content so that a constitutional st- spending limit is the only way that would hold them in place. But they don't talk about any. I mean, where is the reporting on this? Where is the analysis of this that's deeper than just the soundbite or the talking points that were emailed to them by the press secretaries? Yeah, that's that's I've, I've had a long discussion with a friend in Wyoming who reports on the legislature down there. And basically the storyline that I get both up here and down there is that there's just not enough of us. I mean, you got one guy covering the legislature from from the Anchorage Daily News. You got one guy covering it from from the television stations. You know, they, they there's a lot of issues down there that they're trying to deal with. And, and you know, they're just they're just trying to just trying to to. Uh, uh, cover the intake you know without without having time to do a deeper analysis i i'm not sure i accept that uh i mean the anchor shaley news has proven that when they want to they can do a deep dive i mean just look at kyle hopkins pieces on virtually anything uh they right. can do a deep dive on things but uh but, but you know the excuse is well we only got one guy covering it all he really can do is just you know just touch the surface of everything i yeah, and and the pushback I get is, well, if you want that deeper dive, that needs to be done in the op-ed pages, and it needs to be done by uh, by uh, citizens. The problem is, the reporters get to write every day and get you know get to control headlines every day. The op-eds are, you know, by citizens are like once every six months. So it's um, it, it's an excuse. It's not a it's not a it's not a a, a, a true response to the issue. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. Uh, and and I think we we basically lost this. That's the problem. Uh, uh, we basically lost this where we, we had any deeper analysis and people aren't taking the time to do it. Uh, there are a few people like you and others who are are, are digging into this. Uh, but if folks saw that, again, we are the one of the highest tax states in the nation with all this information, I think there'd be a lot of pushback. But again, that's not what they're hearing. What they're hearing is regurgitated, paraphrased talking points from the majorities, from the press secretaries that go out to the reporters and they just dutifully retype them and put them out there and say, this is the story. And uh, with no, again, no more investigate, you know, no more investigation, no more uh, deeper thought. And, and it's troubling to me. Uh, I mean, because, again, I think some of these guys are pretty good reporters. And I don't know if it's just a, a, a lack of direction from the editorial board, if it's just laziness, or if it is, again, some kind of ideology that says, well, I don't really want to get into that because, you know, <laughs> because, again, like the like the House, like the Senate finance, if all of a sudden that was out in the light, we'd have to acknowledge that this is a problem. You know, the other, the other thing, Michael, that I get sometimes is, well, legislators aren't talking about it this way. Legislators don't talk about it. You know uh, uh, the PFD being a tax and, and and having to factor it in in Alaska's tax burden. Uh, you know when I go, one of the comments I've gotten in response is when I go ask legislators uh, what they think about it, nobody says, "Well, it's a tax and 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 it taxes Alaska families." And you have to take that into account when you do the numbers are 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 this. Um, so you know if they're writing about the legislature and they're and they're writing. What legislators are saying. If you don't have any legislators saying that, there's, you know, their their argument is there's really no there there to report. Um, and you know, to some degree, that's true. I, I've honestly uh, never heard a legislator talk about uh, PFT cuts as taxes. I've never heard a legislator factor it in uh, in uh, in calculating the tax burden on Alaskans. I I wish they would, but they don't. Uh, and and as I say, that's another rationalization used for uh, for not reporting the information. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely frustrating. Uh, Jim says, why aren't the villages upset about PFD theft? It hits them the hardest. Uh, I've been surprised, quite honestly, that they haven't been more vocal. And then, quite honestly, their legislators haven't been more vocal about it. Um, you know, I, I would expect them to be. we got about a minute here. I got, I got told once that there's a top 20% out in the villages, too. And that top 20% is our state government employees out in the villages, uh, and and the executives of the village corporations, and and they don't want uh, 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 alternate forms of revenue any more than anybody else. And so you know they're satisfied with PFD cuts as well. 
Oh, that's disappointing. That's uh, that's a little disappointing. We were just talking about uh, the discussions of Senate finance, how Alaska is the third highest, is the state with the third highest tax rate when you factor in the PFD takings, the third highest tax rate in the nation, and uh, how that is not being talked about by any of the local legislators. Uh, and we were just talking about, you know, why Bush legislators aren't, uh, you know, aren't more vocal about this. I mean, why aren't the folks in the in the villages who are, again, feeling that PFD pinch more than anybody else? And former Representative Sharon Jackson's in the chat room. She says Bush legislators voted against the PFD last session. I mean, that's a it's a troubling time, to say the least. So let's move on to number three, which is the governor. And the question of is the governor really looking to solve Alaska's fiscal situation? Is it really? Uh, is it really part of it? And uh, you put up a slide that said revenues, and uh, with a question. So let's uh, let, let's talk about that, Brad. Well, there was a um, this 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 issue comes from a, a snippet in one of Matt Buxton's, who's the Midnight Sun, one of Matt Buxton's pieces last week, uh, where he was uh, talking about revenues. And and that snippet was real short. It said. And as for the revenue question, the legislature also faces political risks of not only passing a tax, but having that tax vetoed by Dunleavy, giving him precisely the kind of platform he'd like heading into the 2022 election. What's the point, said one particular particular over it, Politico explained. Uh, and, then, and then Matt uh, 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 enhanced that in his article uh, or in the Midnight Sun piece uh, uh, yesterday. A fairly long piece that that basically goes through the same the same issue uh, in in much greater detail, and from that I'm 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 I'm, I'm beginning to get the impression that Governor Dunleavy, um, well not beginning but but developing further developing the impression that Governor Governor Dunleavy has become part of the problem, not part of not part of the solution. So this year's budget, the first the first budget in 2019, had deep spending cuts. Um, the governor got a lot of pushback. He didn't get support uh, of 16 legislators for all of those spending cuts. He ended up with significantly less uh, spending cuts, uh, reduced his veto amount, and uh, to, to get 16 legislators to support the reduced amount, um, and ended up with significantly uh, fewer budget cuts. And then we got the recall. And, and the budgets that he's proposed in 2020 and 2021 – uh, have have had much much fewer cuts, not even approaching the level of cuts required to get spending down to uh, uh, traditional revenue levels. The governor uh, in in the latest budget uh, essentially admitted that, uh, and for uh, fiscal year 23, papers over it in fiscal year 2022. Uh, by by proposing a big overdraw from the from the ERA to cover the deficit, essentially draw to tax future generations by by drawing down the the uh, the ERA not to cover it in FY 2022, but for FY 23 uh, and and beyond out to the end of the decade, the governor essentially admits that that there's this huge fiscal gap uh, that continues. And it's called in the, it was called in the ten year plan other revenues that he was going to to balance the, the the budget balance by adding in other revenues, but he's never proposed what those other revenues would be um, and and so we've got a situation and 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 the testimony and consistently is and I believe it to be the case that to have other revenues in place to start in f y twenty three when this huge gap shows up. Uh, in his 10-year fiscal plan, to have other revenues in place, you have to pass them this year. It's going to take a, a year to implement it. Um, so, and the, and the governor hasn't done that. So, you, you got a combination of of not deep enough spending cuts, an admission that we that the state needs other revenues to cover the resulting fiscal gap, but no proposal uh, on on how to cover that that fiscal gap. Which, which clearly is leaving as the as the default mechanism, uh, just continued PFD cuts on on out into the future, deep PFD cuts, because even that other revenue uh, gap that he shows in 23 uh, and beyond is after restructuring the PFD to a, to a POMV 5050. So you've already got about a 400 million, 500 million dollar PFD cut 
uh, uh, built in when you go to POMV 5050, and he's still showing these huge these huge revenue gaps uh, gaps on out. I don't I don't think he's so 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 he hasn't cut spending enough to close the gap. He's showing he's admitting that there's this fiscal gap from FY 23 beyond, but he hasn't proposed anything to deal with it. Um, and and now the, the the Matt Buxton articles essentially say if legislators he said at one time he said at the first first part of this session that well he was going to leave up the other revenues to 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 legislators but now you know reading between the lines on the Matt Buxton article basically what he's saying is I'll veto those uh, if legislators come up with other revenues I'll, I'll veto those so he's not there's not there's not any options left he's taken away the spending cut option. He's taken away the other the other revenue option uh, by not proposing and now indicating that he would veto. He's 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 essentially cutting off every alternative to try to deal with the uh, with with the budget situation. And I and frankly, you know, if if he's not part of the solution, he's part of the problem. And and he certainly has not made himself part of the solution. I mean, what you could do is is say. We're going to have spending cuts. This is going to be the, the size of it. We're going to have a spending cap, uh, an effective spending cap, um, and and I'm going to come up with other revenues to, to balance the remainder between, you know, what spending levels are going to be after these spending cuts and the, and, and the spending cap, uh, and 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 that's how that's how we're going to do it. And, that, and I that's my proposal. And, and and here we go. But he's not done any of that. Right. Uh, so it's I. I I, I think the governor is is has has put him has made himself part of the problem, uh, certainly not part of the solution. I mean, what was the intent here? I mean, if you're if you're looking through the governor's eyes and you're looking at this, was his intent to put the legislators on the hot seat and make and make them you know politically pay for it, or what are you saying? I think I think at the beginning of the session, uh, you know, reading between the lines, it was make the legislators come up with the solution. Um, I, I will. I, the governor, will show you the gap, but make the legislators come up with the solution. Now, with the with the buzz about about you know vetoing, uh, it's it, the, the 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 interpretation is even if you come up with a solution, I'm going to veto it. Uh, and and so that's only, that's going to leave this revenue gap uh, and and this fiscal gap, and I'm I'm going to leave you without any way of closing it. Other than continued PFD cuts, I watch this, and, I, and I'm just I'm trying to figure out. I mean, it, it, you know, he wants to pass the buck over to the legislature, but at some point, if you're going to pass the buck to the legislature, and then on top of that, you're just, I mean, it looks like as you were saying, reading between the lines, he's just going to veto it anyway as a political position to say, look, I'm the guy that vetoed all these new taxes coming into the 2022 election cycle. I mean, there's still no solution. It means that we just draw it more out of the ERA and and we kick the can down the road for another year. Yeah, we draw it either out of the ERA or we or we just deepen the PFD cuts. And I and frankly, you know, looking at the legislature, it'll be the latter. They'll just deepen the PFD cuts, um, uh, taxes on middle and lower income uh, Alaska families. I mean, that's the only option he's leaving. If if he's gonna if he's not gonna make the cuts. Uh, and, and, you know, as we talked early on in this legislature, if he was ever going to have 16 behind him to make deep cuts, this was going to be the legislature where he was, where he was going to have 16. He didn't have 21 plus 11 to affirmatively change the law to reduce spending, but he had at least 16 who were hardcore enough that would back him up on, on, if, on, on deep spending cuts. If he's not going to make those deep spending cuts, and he said he's not in the, in the budget, um, and, and he's not going to, let the legislature come up with an alternative revenue solution. He's leaving nothing else other than taxing future Alaskans through ERA overdraws or taxing current Alaskans, middle and lower income Alaska families through, through PFD cuts. He's not, he's not, he's not part of the solution. So when the governor goes out and says, I'm all for the PFD, I want to preserve the PFD. He's, he's, he's being disingenuous because he's not leaving any tools on the table uh, to fix this situation, other than uh, to take uh, take the PFD now, or to take it in the future through uh, through ERA cuts now. Well, uh, I mean, this is just uh, it's so frustrating in so many ways. I don't even know what to say at this point. Uh, other than again, if he's part of the problem, we you know we need to figure out we need to figure out what the better solution here is. Which I think again comes back to the size and scope of government, whether we uh, whether we want it to or not. There's not you know. 
like you said, there may not be a whole lot left to cut that make it simple, but we should be cutting where we can. Uh, and unfortunately, that's that's not what we're getting right now. So, and, and we're not getting it out of the governor. I mean, yeah. that's, that's that's the point, Michael. I mean, if that's if that's the solution, that's not the solution. The governor's going down. I, yeah, and you can you can say it's the recall. You can say it's the lack of support in 2019. You can lay it off on a lot of things, but that's no longer his solution. Yeah. And 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 his solution is, I mean, basically he's he's positioning for reelection. Uh, uh, without having done anything to help solve the problem uh, in in his four years in office, yeah. Um, and you know, and and what does that mean? Well, that means you start looking for other candidates in in the twenty twenty two election cycle. Well, it's a sad, sad thing. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, we'll we'll see what happens here. Uh, but it, again, it doesn't. Uh, it it doesn't look it doesn't look good for the old home team. Let's put it that way right now as we continue to push forward on this. It uh, doesn't. And, and the new thing the new thing you need to factor in is these Matt Buxton articles about reading between the lines that the governor has said has indicated that he's going to veto uh, any solution the legislature comes up with. So yeah, you know, from the legislature standpoint, why do it? Yeah, no, I mean, I guess that's the point. Why, why get into that fight when you feel like you're just going to get your legs kicked out from underneath you anyway? In the in the end. Uh, I think that's the I think that's the the bigger issue here. All right, well, uh, Brad, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate you coming on board and joining us today. Thank you, Michael. As always, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley. Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.